a solved crime. <laughs> so by the time it was actually a reality, I, I couldn't figure out how I would be happy running this show in success. So I just eased my way out the back door. Mm. And, uh, and it, it's doing very well. Like It's, 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 it's fun, and I, I loved creating the character because that was very much... Whether you love or, or hate the show, that character is as, re- is a result of what I wrote and my approach to it. And again, like kind of a, a rock and roll approach to the devil, um, who of course is very rock and roll to start with. But um, yeah, yeah. I know. just listen to any ACDC record. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, yeah, so, I mean, Lucifer is, is still ongoing, and they, it got canceled, but then it got brought back on Netflix, so, yeah, yeah. you know, it's got a huge fan base, and um, it's great, the people who it's are... It's the devil, of yeah, course, it's, it's got a fan base. Yeah, Joe Henderson, who runs it, he's done a fantastic job yeah. with it, and uh, yeah. it's cool. And, and, and I think on, on the following show, you just, you just, like, reinvented yourself, you know, with White Famous. Yeah, it, with, not intentionally, and White Famous came about because Showtime had bought a project from Jamie Foxx called White Famous, and I guess a couple of his stand-up comedian friends had written a script, and the Showtime was never quite happy with how the script turned out, so based on working with me on Californication, they thought, oh, maybe Tom could come in and, and come up with his own take on it. And I went to meet Fox, and he was hilarious. And, um, you know, I said, yeah, I'll take a crack at it. And it was, it was fun. I had fun writing it. And unfortunately, it's one of those things. Sometimes you put a show on, it's like throwing a party. Sometimes people don't show up, you know? <laughs> you know, that's, that's interesting where you say, I tra- I'll take a crack at it. Yeah. It's like, for example, when I audition for a gig, I'm there to get the gig. Yeah. There's no, like, I'm going to take a crack at it. Right, right. But approaching it from the other way, I'll take mm-hmm. a crack at it. Yeah. What does that really mean to you? Well, in that case, it meant that I don't know if I'm the right guy for this. Interesting. But there's enough here. You know, I was able to latch on to the fact that, you know, in the world of black stand-up comedians, the concept of, of selling out is, is a much more stronger, potent thing than I think for any white comedian. Because they don't want to, if they have a core black fan base, they don't want to do anything to, to alienate that fan base. So if, if you're trying to cross over to being white famous, which is so famous that even white people know who you are, mm-hmm. it's a dicier journey. But I was able to latch on to the, the, this idea of like a comedian or an artist just not wanting to sell out. Because I, I could relate to that. You know, I came out to L.A. to write movies and I ended up on, a, on Dawson's Creek, which is a teen drama and, you know, you make a lot of money. But Sometimes I would feel like, ah, oh, this is not really me. This is not all I wanted to do. So, and I think coming from like a music rock and roll background, the, the idea of like, ah, oh, I don't want to sell out, you know, because all the stuff I loved growing up didn't have mainstream acceptance, you know. So I brought a little of that attitude with me into into entertainment. So uh, taking a crack at it meant there's enough here that I think I could do something with it. But you're right. I think there are some things you do where you go, I know this, and there's no, there's no um, concept of just half-assing it. It's like, I'm going to mm-hmm. do it. Yeah. And this was more like, I think I was a little bit more distant from it, where I think it's fun. Let me try it. You know? Yeah, it's cool. uh, I, I, would, I mean, if I was in your shoes, I would look at it in a way of like, I'm going to see if I got what it takes to actually mm-hmm. to be able to do this. Yeah. So it's almost like self-discovery. Yeah, it was self-discovery, and it was fun. I mean, we put together a great cast, and I treated it, since it was set in L.A., I treated it as though it was set in the same Californication universe, and I brought in some Californication characters. So that was fun for it me. It was a lot of fun, yeah. Yeah, and, I was, yeah. and if, you're, if you didn't know the show, it wouldn't matter. If you were a fan of the show, it was kind of like fun little stuff to do. Um. But, you know, it was the, the not fun parts were any time, I think when you deal with race, there's a lot of fear, especially, you know, they hired a white guy to write a black show, so there's a lot of fear from the network. Um, there was a lot of, which is hard when you're trying to make a comedy, because a comedy is just about going for broke and not second-guessing yourself. And there was a lot of second-guessing with this one. So, 
and we we happened to premiere at maybe the worst time in history, which you know we premiered the Sunday after the Harvey Weinstein stuff <laughs> broke, and we had a we had a Hollywood producer character in the show played by <laughs> Stephen Tobolowski, who was a huge pervert, a sweet, lovable pervert, but you know everybody was so afraid of what that would mean, and so it just was not. There was a lot. <laughs> Yeah, but you're, you're not known for doing politically correct. No, so. I'm the worst guy to do. I, I could care less. I just, <laughs> you know, if you give me a half hour, I'm going to oh. fill it with, you know, what I think is funny. Whose idea was to put Jimmy Fox in a dress? Even though I'm familiar with his character, you know, the Wanda character I think from, it, uh, you know, Living Color. I think it was Fox's idea himself. I think he always liked the idea of, you know, playing a twisted version of himself. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I feel like when I first met with him, he talked about wanting to encourage Floyd, the main character, to put on the dress and how it was a no big deal because he's always wearing a dress himself. Mm -hmm. You know, so, yeah, yeah so that, that came from yeah. him. Yeah, and there was another running thread from the show from Californication to uh, Like Famous that I, you know, I think there's a running thread. It's your love for agents. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, I do. I do. I do love agents. I have the greatest agent in the world, um, who who bears no resemblance to any agent character I've ever written. Uh, but yeah, there was uh, there's something I love about the agent sidekick. Maybe I love it too much. Maybe I need to give it a rest. No, it's great. I love it because I, I think we need more agents right. in more shows. Right. You know, it's 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 a great character. I think it's very complex because. You're in the middle. You're trying yeah. to negotiate on, on behalf of your client, and you're trying to be negotiating. You know, be friends with the with the industry itself. You know, so yeah. it's kind of like it's almost like a pimp. Right? And you can't really do better than Entourage at at, at creating the good agent character. Mm -hmm. So I always like to focus on the ones that are a little bit sad and desperate because that's that seems funnier to me. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we have agents in the uh, in in the music industry. I sure. mean, I'm you know, my current agent is a wonderful, but I've had other agents that were not so yeah. um, you know, ethical. Yeah. Let's say, you know. Yeah. So I can really relate to that. Yeah, the agent I have now, I've had since I started my career, but I did leave him briefly. And I, I think I lasted all of about 90 days, and I ended up in an agency where I didn't enjoy it at all. And I, I just called up my agent, and I said, is it okay if I come back? He's like, yeah, sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, they're not all great. Yeah. But so going back to you being a musician, yeah. you started out in Long Island. Long Island, yeah. Long I was born Island. in the Bronx, grew up on Long Island. My parents made the, the white flight to the suburbs mm -hmm. early on when I was about three or four, so I just had the prototypical suburban existence. I think I met one of your former music, uh, bandmates. You met the guy I was talking about earlier, Dan? the one I moved out to yeah. LA with. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, he was great. Yeah, yeah he's a yeah. great guy and he still yeah. plays bass all the time in bands. Going back to Californication, because, yeah. I mean, I, I love the show and it just left a, such a, uh, a mark, you know, because there were so many things that I could relate to. One of the characters is the the Hank Moody's friend that comes in from Long Island yeah. and stays with him. That's right. Is that yeah. based on real... I mean, that's a... I don't think there's any one person it's based on. It's probably a composite of so many different people I knew back then. Absolutely. But there, I can't point to any one. Yeah, or you know? a figure. Yeah. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah. 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 yeah, but it's a it's 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 exp kind of like an experience that you've had. Yeah, for sure, and that's that's funny. I hadn't thought about that in a long time, and I named him after I named him Zlaz, which is I guess Neil Zlozauer, the yeah, photographer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so there, yeah. that was the little rock and roll Easter egg yeah, there. Yeah, is yeah. that I kind of made a reference? Does Neil know know that? No, I've never met Neil. So you never met Neil. No, oh, I've never met great. Neil, but well, I'm a huge fan. So uh, when, next time I see him, I'll, I'll mention okay, it to good, him. Good. He'll, he'll get a kick out of that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but that was fun, and it's a, and it's a little bit, I think, based on how I felt coming out to L.A. the first time and, and living. You do feel, like coming from Long Island, you feel a bit like a fish out of water. So, mm -hmm. you know, and, and again, like having friends from back there, and uh, yeah, I don't know. It's funny, I haven't thought about that episode in a really long time. <laughs> it was definitely a great episode. Yeah. 
It definitely was. What do you get from writing that you do not get from music and vice versa? What I get from writing that I don't get from music... Well, from writing, I get a true sense of completion, you know, because I feel like I can't... I can't really compose music, So, but with an episode of TV... I can come up with my own version of a song, you know, because mm-hmm. it's a, you're trying to capture. And actually, my whole approach to, to the seasons of television, especially on Californication, was informed by music. It was, okay, we're going to do a season of TV. A TV, that's 12 episodes. So it's sort of like an album. 12 songs, yeah. Yeah, and you're going to go in and you don't know, you may not know exactly what songs are going to be the, you know, the real rockers or the power ballads. So. There's different tones to the episodes. You know, I would do episodes of Californication that were the equivalent of the power ballad, where they were more emotional. And then you would do ones that were just balls out funny. Um, and there was a degree of, of improv to it, because it wasn't tightly scripted. I mean, the episodes themselves were scripted, but the season arc wasn't, you know, okay... I know exactly what's going to happen. I would know the beginning, I would know the end, and I'd have fun along the way. Um, so, so yeah, so everything with, with writing is informed by music, but what I think I don't get from writing that you get from music is just losing yourself in it. Because the whole process of, of, of writing and making television, it's ultimately pretty conservative and you know, the times I've played music and really enjoyed it, it's like you get to leave your body a little bit and escape. Whereas, you know, I have that sometimes with writing where I can sit down and write something and it's almost like meditation. I kind of, four hours go by and you're like, oh, wow, where did that go? Um, but that's a hard thing to achieve every time. Usually it's kind of a grind. Whereas with music, it's it, there's usually, there's an element of pure fun to it that... I'm not getting from the writing side of things. Hmm. You know, fr- writing is fun when you see it actualized and you're on set and you're like, okay, that's really funny. But by that point, you're not participating in it anymore. You know, you're just looking at the finished product and, and realizing, okay, that's, that's fun and people are going to enjoy that, but I'm not in it anymore. It's just, it's just the final result. Whereas music, you're in it. So that's interesting. Yeah. You know, uh, from my experience, uh, you know, let's say you're working on a record, yeah. and most of the times, by the time it is mixed, it's it for better or for worse, it's not exactly your original vision right. of of the music. You know, sure. the way it should come out. Do you experience that when you're writing? That once it's you know it's handed over to a director, and yeah, you experience the good and bad of it, which is. Sometimes you write something and the finished product is so much better than you thought. Oh, wow. You know, because of so many people come together to make it, whether it's, you know, it's the actors, the director, the production design, you know, the location you've picked. And sometimes you're so pleased by how everything came together. And then sometimes TV can be the great mediocrity machine, which is you can, you can feed a great script into it and somehow it ends up less than you thought. And, but you never learn how or why. It's, it's, that's the great mystery of it. You know, just sometimes all the elements don't add up. You know, sometimes the performance is off or sometimes the ro- location's completely wrong and, and bums you out. So, you know, I've, so I've seen the good and the bad. Hmm. What's next for you? I don't know. I mean, post-White Famous, I've just been writing my own stuff. I just finished a script that has to do with actually the music world. So I want to see what I, I can do with that. I mean, it's not quite ready to go out into the world yet. Um, and I'm just looking at opportunities that come my way, but I've had a nice, you know, six months off or so, mm-hmm. but I'm eager to get back to work. Yeah. Can't <laughs> wait for you to get back to work. I know, I know. We need more of your incredible writing on <laughs> television or, or, or in the movies. Yeah. We need more of your writing. I mean, I need another book. You need another book? I'm working on a coloring book. Oh, good. That's perfect. That's the perfect follow-up. <laughs> Crayons not included. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tom. My pleasure. What a pleasure. Same what a here. pleasure. Same God here. bless you. Thank you. We're shaking hands Thank now. You.
<laughs> Shaking hands. <laughs>